I wasn't close to the art world. Like, you know, many people, I would visit some museum at some time, but that was it. My closest connection with art was actually martial art. Welcome on board this ESCP flight to Knowledge. Our flight time today would be less than 30 minutes. The outside temperature is abnormally high. A faculty member will be with you shortly to help you understand what impact their research can have on business and society. If you hear brace, brace, please pay extra attention as only science can alter our collision course. For this episode of Brace, the podcast about impactful research by ESCP faculty, we talk to Sylvain Bureau. Based on his research, he developed the art thinking method, which is designed to help new strategies, managerial solutions, business models, or communication tools that appear to be improbable at first sight emerge with certainty. A visiting scholar at Duke, UC Berkeley, or the City University of New York, Sylvain Bureau teaches this agile method in collaboration with artists and cultural institutions in France and abroad. Sylvain Bureau, welcome aboard. You graduated from prestigious French schools before joining ESCP. How did you envision your career in academia back then? Well, I had no clue, actually. Uh, I, I uh, didn't know anything about academia. And so what happened is that I uh, started to do a research master, and uh, I felt like it was almost like the first time I was able to... Uh, think beyond and try to uh, criticize what is. Uh, I had a really fabulous uh, professors uh, like uh, Isabelle Uho, uh, Gerard Koenig and Bernard Forg. Uh, I was really uh, pleased with this experience and decided to continue. And I was able to uh, uh, obtain a grant to study at Ecole Polytechnique for my PhD. And uh, that's how I started to, to go into this uh, world of academia. Okay. Um, which path did you choose then, or which path chose you? Did you want to go into research, uh, uh. teaching? So when I started to uh, do my PhD, uh, actually I wasn't too sure about what I wanted to do next. Uh, I enjoyed the process of doing research. I enjoyed this position that you need to adopt in the sense that you have to Uh, you are trying to understand. You are trying to understand uh, phenomenon, uh, social phenomenon, and uh, that was to me uh, very key. You know, and I really wanted to better understand the world uh, with my little uh, situation. And the content that I was studying wasn't clear at that time, in the sense that I wasn't too sure that it was my the core of what I wanted to do. I was so my focus. Uh, as always in, but how about how people work? How do you work? What does it mean to work? So at the beginning, I was interested by the impact of new technologies, uh, especially web technologies on, on working conditions and competencies and occupations, but it was not clear. So what happened is that during my PhD, uh, I was enrolled uh, as a teaching assistant for a course migling students from Ecole Polytechnique and HSC uh, in entrepreneurship. I really enjoyed the fact that you uh, merge and confront students from different schools, and I enjoyed the topic. Uh, I didn't know anything about that at, the, at that time. And then when I joined ESCP uh, in 2006, they told me about the creation of a, of a new chair, And uh, I, was, uh, I decided to launch a specific class with ESCP students and students from Central uh, Paris at that time about entrepreneurship. And Jacqueline Fent, uh, my colleague who launched the Chair of Entrepreneurship supported by EY, proposed me to, to, to work with her. Uh, and that's what I did. And that's how I, I started to work in this field of entrepreneurship. So you enjoyed what you were saying about your PhDs, that you enjoyed the, the in intellectual process, but you weren't so clear Yes, about I think, you know, uh, what is uh, quite amazing when you join this academic world is that 
you uh, every day <laughs> you learn and you, you you learn that you don't know much uh, you you read uh, things which are so fascinating and you try to add your contribution and so you are not looking for immediate quick Uh, impact uh, so you need to be patient mm. but along the way uh, you will uh, uh, you know gain more knowledge and you will add some elements to this uh, immense field of, of knowledge and you will share you will share and discuss with a lot of people we are very clever uh, colleagues peers as well as students participants and all these encounters and interactions lead to uh, new learning and new uh, possibilities and perspectives Back then, did you have a particular interest in art or did that come along as well by meeting people? My closest connection with art was actually martial arts. So I started to do uh, judo uh, at the age of six and I, you know, Uh, practiced uh, many different uh, martial arts. So I did uh, Aikido, Jiu-Jitsu, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, French boxing. Now I'm doing Thai boxing. So I wasn't close to the art world. I enjoyed literature. Like, you know, many people, I would visit some museum at some time, but that was it. So really, everything happened through an encounter, uh, an improbable encounter. You started publishing scientific papers about art and business or art and uh, entrepreneurship quickly after your PhD and the best thesis award you got. What brought you, what brought about this scientific exploration into art? So actually everything started uh, far away from the scientific uh, environment. I was uh, experiencing a wedding, French wedding, uh, and as you may know, uh, French weddings are very long, so you have time to meet and discuss. Uh, and at that time I met a, a, a young artist, Pierre Tectin, who... Uh, you know, explain his work, his activities. And I was really surprised because many things that he said to me sounded quite close from entrepreneurial practices in some ways. And I was skeptical or I was not totally satisfied by the way we uh, tended to teach in, in business schools, meaning using case studies, using PowerPoints, using Excel files. And if I felt that it was very relevant... Uh, and I had a very impressive experience myself as a, as a professor uh, um, uh, at Harvard Business School for a train-the-trainer session where we were taught how to, uh, to do case studies. Uh, I felt that there was something missing, at least on my side. I, I, didn't, uh, I felt that we needed more and complementary practices. So when I met Pierre Tectin, I think it was 2007 or maybe 2008, I said to him, okay, let's try to do something together. And uh, we, uh, he, he sent me a proposal uh, which was related to a, a practice, a very famous practice in art that I did not know at that time, uh, related to the Situationist International. So what is quite interesting is that this movement is uh, seen as extreme left with people like Guy Debord and he proposed to use this notion of drift that they invented to uh, rediscover a district, to re-explore cities. I really recommend you to uh, check about the drift and uh, explore, experience it yourself. So we started to uh, ask our students to experience this drift Because when you are an entrepreneur, you have no clear goal and you need to uh, be able to move and explore without a clear tra trajectory, which is exactly the point of a drift. And that was also a way to have our students escape the business school walls uh, and borders and to beat otherness. So that's what we did uh, in 2008. Uh, it went very well and we continued uh, the process. Uh, w when, why, and how did you decide to develop the Improbable Seminar? Based on these first experiences with the drifts, I had the chance, thanks to ESCP, to experience the sabbatical. So I went to uh, New York City and I was uh, welcome at the City University of New York. And I studied a bit more uh, subversive practices in arts and I started to apprehend subversive practices in entrepreneurship. So subversion is a practice uh, which involves 
you know, strong critique uh, regarding the existing systems. Uh, and you can find that in art, obviously, but also in entrepreneurship. So when you think of entrepreneurs who are trying, for instance, to challenge the, the monopoly of the, of the state on issuing money, that's quite subversive. Huh? So uh, 20 years ago, you would discuss about uh, PayPal. Today, you discuss about cryptocurrencies. Uh, but this is not only about technologies. This is not about only about uh, businesses. It's also about politics. And uh, I didn't know how to discuss these uh, questions with my students uh, with traditional formats of teaching. So what I wanted to do is uh, enable uh, my students to discuss politics, to discuss uh, their ideologies, uh, to discuss big issues uh, of our world uh, through a detour in the art uh, world. Because uh, in art practices, you have many movements uh, which uh, apprehend social, societal uh, issues. Uh, and because we are in France, uh, you can raise your voice, you can exp express yourself and not only try to... Uh, uh, you know, answer clients' demands, but also, you know, what what are you interested in? What is your motivation? Why why are you doing what you do? Uh, that was the, the idea. Uh, so ask Pierre, okay, would you be ready to have this experience where students would not only have to do a drift, but also create a piece of art to raise uh, a subversive question? And because at that time we had no clue about what we were going to do, about the impact, about the format, we decided to name the seminar Improbable because we didn't know what would happen. It was highly unexpected. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Um, where are the workshops taught? At that time, you know, we... It was so improbable that we didn't even uh, we didn't write a, a syllabus. Uh, we had no syllabus, and I know today that you have you know all the accreditors who ask for a very formal syllabus and aspects of learning. And if we had that at that time, I don't know if we were would have been able to do this format. So no syllabus. We were protected by uh, the chair of entrepreneurship, and it was uh, quite the pioneering area. So. We thought, okay, we cannot do this experience, pedagogical experience, within a, a traditional classroom. So uh, thanks to some little funding we had with the chair, we discovered this uh, location, which was uh, called La Cartonnerie, a very uh, fascinating uh, area, which used to be a uh, uh, sort of small factory to create kind of uh, boxes and uh, things like that. And we met the guy, he was very nice, but he told us, okay, your budget is really limited. We had only 1,000 euros. We wanted to do a four-day workshop, spend a full night with 40 students. So he was a bit skeptical. But he said, okay, if you can help me clean the space, then I would be ready to welcome you. And what he said, clean the space, it wasn't, you know, just a little cleaning. It was a massive work. So we decided to do it. So with some friends and colleagues, one of them being uh, Maeva Tordo, uh, who is today the head of the incubator uh, Blue Factory. Thank, Ma thank you, Maeva, again for this support. We cleaned the space for three days and it it was a fabulous moment because then we, we had this amazing uh, location to experience this seminar with our students and it was critical to launch uh, the, uh, the experiment and to make it work. And now you're teaching at uh, Centre Pompidou and the Louvre. And... Yeah, so now we are a bit more comfortable. And clearly, uh, in my occupation and my job, ESCP is not asking me to do the cleaning. But I guess that if you want to have a sort of a entrepreneurial endeavor inside academia, you also need sometimes to do things which are not supposed to be done. So yes, we, we continue the process. And then we had people from uh, Centre Pompidou uh, asking uh, to collaborate with us and proposing to organize this seminar inside the, the Pompidou. It was also sort of a very entrepreneurial situation because uh, Centre Pompidou wasn't used to have uh, adults creating uh, uh, openings, exhibitions. So we also had to fight and it wasn't so comfortable the first time but then you know along the way you organize the process you discuss with the teams uh, so more and more we are able to uh, organize uh, wonderful uh, spaces to make that happen so that people can uh, share their work at the end with a nice uh, vernissage as mm -hmm. we say in French and you do that abroad too 
right? Yes, so uh, we started to have demands from uh, Finnish colleagues. So I did it in Aalto University, first time, uh, which was outside ESCP. Very, very fascinating place, super uh, north in Europe, very cold, uh, even in May sometimes. Uh, yes, and along the way, we had uh, discussions with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Canadian colleagues, Japanese colleagues, American colleagues. So we did it in 13 countries. And it's always a way to challenge uh, our methods that we uh, described as as the art thinking method. Uh, so basically, it's a method to create the improbable with certainty. Uh, so I'm not so much interested in creativity. Uh, you know, people tend to say, whenever you say art, people think right away creativity. But actually, great artists are not so much famous because of their creativity. They are famous because they were able to develop new systems of values, new systems of norms to assess what is a good or bad piece of art. Uh, and they don't do it by themselves. They do it with different collectives, different individuals. And if, if you think of cubism, the movement created a new field where you can say this is a good or bad cubist piece. But uh, obviously, at first, people uh, were not uh, able to uh, understand what was this painting. So when you create, you have to create also the, the institutions which would give uh, people knowledge and uh, criteria to say okay this is good this is bad this is our field this is not our field mm. and you do that because you are unhappy you are frustrated you are not satisfied with the existing situation and through a very emergent process uh, you propose something new uh, and most of the time when you start you don't even know what you're doing and that's a good sign huh? so if you are not really clear about what you are doing it's probably interesting. This fuzziness is very interesting to work with. Mm -hmm. um, how do the, the, the workshop themselves, how do they work? So the idea of the workshop is to uh, propose people to have a formative live experience. I think people, at the end of the day, they are not interested in diploma. They are not interested for a grade. Of course, it's compulsory, it's key, but people are interested uh, by, uh, by their life, by how you can experience new situations to learn. So my, my job, I think, is to design experiences where people would uh, do things and think about things in a different way uh, to learn and also probably unlearn. So we have, I would say, three main goals. So one is to uh, share knowledge, uh, conceptual, theoretical knowledge. Another one is to help them uh, develop their competencies. And the last one is about uh, experiencing emotions because we know that people will forget very fast <laughs> what you told them uh, unless they have emotions connected to what they learned. So we would have conferences to uh, you know, explain knowledge about how people create how they create in art, in science, is business, because we are trying to show the similarities. Uh, so we display some key practices uh, uh, with very uh, strong references in social sciences. Then they would, uh, we would make the connections with their um, activities, their jobs, their companies, so that they can see how to project what they are receiving and what they could do. And to help them uh, do that, we also organize workshops where they really have to practice themselves in teams. And that's where they develop competencies because they have to do things right away. Uh, they have to deliver after two to three days a piece of art with quite high expectations. So they need skills. And we would do some, uh, help them do a reflexive uh, work to be able to connect what they learned with their uh, current activities to implement some of the learnings. And, uh, and the third element is the emotional component. This process is super hard because creation is not clear, it's, it's not easy. Uh, and most of the time, and normally you fail all the time. You fail unless, until something emerge and looks promising and interesting. And I guess my uh, colleagues who are doing research experience that all the time. You know, you receive peer feedback reviews and it's a disaster and you need to do it again and do it again and do it again. If you are an entrepreneur, you would pivot all the time. So the, the routine is failing mode, huh? but uh, the question is how do you fail to learn, to expand, to, to improve? So people are quite disturbed because obviously most of them, they never did anything like uh, country art. Uh, it's very brand new. But at the end, there is the opening. 
And at the end, they are extremely uh, impressed and happy with what they did and what the colleagues uh, were able to do. Uh, so it's highly emotional in that regard. Okay. You mentioned uh, drift. Drift is one of the six Ds. Uh, another one is destruction. Do any of a particular role? Maybe to uh, go back to the core motivation for this workshop uh, is that uh, uh, nowadays, uh, in many contexts, uh, the probable is unacceptable. So you know the trend and you know that this trend is not good. It's not good for you, it's not good for your surroundings. Uh, and one emblematic case of this uh, question is related to the Anthropocene. So we know that the climate and the biodiversity are going in the wrong direction to sustain our living environments. So we have been doing that for at least 50 years now. So we know that the probable is, a, is catastrophic, is dramatic. So if you are only trying to optimize what you have been doing, uh, it's going to get worse. Uh, so the question is, how can you create improbable patterns, improbable uh, paths, so you escape this trend? And to make that happen, you need, for instance, to destroy some of the existing situation. You need to destroy some norms, some values, some rules, some uh, uh, KPI, which are making you things which are terrible for uh, your planet. So we help people learn how to do it because obviously you still need to make money, you still need to work on an everyday basis. So how can you be able to push something even even if you don't exactly know where you're going. Uh, so we learn how to manage a project without a clear goal, with limited resources, with unexpected uh, outcomes, uh, and still maintain uh, you know, the core of your organization, because otherwise uh, you will be bankrupt very soon. Uh, so this is not easy, uh, but we have no choice. Uh, we have no choice, so people who would like to act uh, can learn. They are, we, we, know some, we have expertise, and the specificity of human beings is that they have been creating again and again the improbable. History is changed by improbable practices, improbable movements, sometimes for the worst, and hopefully sometimes also for the best. So uh, I have no, I have my personal opinions, but I help people and I share with people some methods, some expertise, so they can push the improbable when they are super unhappy with the probable. Um, more generally, what's the impact and, and the benefits for ESCP students, but also uh, executives and entrepreneurs? I would say that there are three main uh, types of impact. So the first one is uh, people are super happy, you know. Uh, and sometimes, you know, in business schools, you have all these criteria about, you know, uh, learnings, goals, and things like that. But uh, to me, this is very critical that at some point people are experiencing strong emotions and happiness. And uh, I would say also... Uh, believes that we can do things, we can act, uh, we can go beyond what is, because sometimes the situation is not so easy uh, for our students and participants. We experience COVID, uh, there are some wars, you know, uh, uh, the Anthropocene. So the climate can be quite difficult. Uh, so sharing some moments uh, with uh, wonderful souvenirs, with wonderful memories uh, can be also critical. Uh, and this is also useful because, uh, as I explained before, people will remember better the theories, the concepts, because it is attached to uh, an, an emotion, to, to a memory. So people learn things, and we have many feedback from uh, entrepreneurs and executives who explain that they change their practices, they change the way they do things on the ground, in their routines. Uh, and we also have some people who were able to go uh, beyond uh, what they used to do and create really dramatic changes in their, in their life sometimes and in their career because they launch a new project which would be, for instance, more sustainable. So I can share uh, the case of Simon uh, uh, Simon, who was created by a former uh, executive from La Redoute And today she's uh, sharing this new uh, uh, shop and website uh, which high criteria in terms of social and environmental in impact. Uh, so that's one example of people who felt that they could act because they learned how to do things. You also co-founded the, the Art Thinking Collective. What's the idea? 
so of course I'm presenting the story as if I was you know the only one in the room <laughs> but uh, when you create something like that you cannot work by yourself and alone because you don't know so many things so as I explained I met Pierre Tectin and he, he shared with me so many uh, relevant references and practices and tips about these things so that was his first collaboration but along the way some people came and we met some people and we started to collaborate with other artists other Uh, art mediators, other researchers, and they contributed to what we have been doing. And the idea was how to work together. Uh, so I was not going to ask ESCP to hire all of them, and it would have been a disaster because what we want is to have people who are far from us, who are in the art in, uh, sector, who are in the design sector, who are in museums, uh, we are in tech, you know, uh, and that's how you can improve what you do. Uh, so we proposed to some of them to become affiliate professors, and today we have uh, artists who are part of ESCP, but we also wanted to have people who were connected through this art thinking network. Uh, so today it's about a, a network with 100 participants uh, in different countries. And that's a good way also to diffuse and share what we have been developing at ESCP. So today you would have colleagues based at EM Lyon, at Schema, uh, at uh, ex Marseille University, and also in our countries like uh, Japan or Canada. And that's uh, a way to connect and keep connected. So for instance, what we do is we would have uh, trained the training sessions. So we help each other to improve our conferences, our mentoring during the workshops. And too often, professors are a bit alone in their class and I think that's a shame and we should have more situation to learn from each other. Uh, we would also have an internal seminar uh, that we call the siesta. So it's a moment where you, you relax. So we have a, a power nap where a colleague from the network would explain some key expertise that we could uh, use uh, or we have a guest f uh, who is from outside the network uh, a royal siesta a researcher a great artist and we would learn also from the from this uh, talk uh, so that's a, yes that's a growing network and that's a super uh, rewarding and uh, and a great way to learn uh, through these collaborations okay How does uh, art thinking compare to other methods like design thinking, which some of our professors on the Berlin campus are very uh, keen on? Yes, yeah, so uh, art, art thinking is, a, is, a, is an agile method. Uh, so many things that we do and that we teach are common knowledge, common practices, uh, like prototyping, how to fail, feedback sessions. So there are many components which are quite close to what exists. Uh, so in that sense, our thinking and the improbable workshop, uh, which is designed to help you learn the art thinking methods, is a wonderful introduction to many key concepts, methods, knowledge, which are relevant today. But it's also a way to discuss things that you won't apprehend very well with design thinking, with business modeling, with lean startups, and things like that. I would say there are two main elements. So the first one is we do not care about clients and users. What we are looking for is your own perspectives, your own vision, your own ideology. Why? Because we know that artists, entrepreneurs, researchers, they do things that they like, that they care for. Otherwise, it won't work very well. But surprisingly, agile methods are obsessed with users and clients, which is good at some point in the process, but you should also know what motivates you, what drives you, because if it's going to be very hard, you want to have this motivation to do things, uh, and that's what we apprehend in our thinking. We want to know more about you. We want to understand better who you are, why, what's wrong with the, your surroundings, and what, what do you want to change. The second element, which is not so much about you, but it's about big societal problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in entrepreneurship, for instance, some people develop social entrepreneurship. It's perfectly uh, fine, it's useful. But many societal issues and social problems or ecological challenges are connected with mainstream companies. Uh, if I am Facebook, I'm changing the democratic system. I'm changing uh, the notion of privacy. These are super important societal issues. But if you only apprehend normal entrepreneurship, normal companies through typical business models, you did not discuss these issues. And they are parents. So in our workshop, we're able to address political challenges, societal challenges, and discuss your position and how you see things and how you could apprehend these uh, 
trends and, and tensions uh, along the way. So I would say that uh, our thinking is super complementary to other methods. And usually we use it as a, as a first step uh, to help people introduce and emerge themselves in creative practices uh, and also better understand who they are and who they could become. They are interesting. Thank you. Uh, can you cite examples of companies you work with? Uh, we have been working with many large corporations. Uh, so, for instance, we, we have seminars with companies like uh, Air France KLM, with uh, Banque Populaire Caisse d'Epargne, a massive and large European bank, uh, with La Redoute, with Galerie Lafayette, with uh, EDF. We also had uh, uh, workshops um, with uh, the French special agencies. Uh, so it's very diverse and uh, it is relevant for two kinds of audience. Either you are uh, central in your organization, you are you know, central management, top management, uh, and you want people to be more aware of the big trends big transformations, uh, mainly related to uh, ecological challenges or related to artificial intelligence, because we know that artific artificial intelligence is uh, impacting many jobs and occupations. Uh, and if you are only optimizing things, maybe the machines you know, can uh, do what you do. Uh, so how can you learn with machines? How can you learn uh, to, to work better with machines? How can you be more creative, more uh, relevant to uh, collaborate with human beings? That's something we learn through this workshop where you improve your artistic intelligence. And this AI, this artistic intelligence, is super complementary to artificial intelligence. So in a sense, art is the, you know, the last uh, step in this, uh, uh, it's, it's at the avant-garde uh, to some extent to, uh, in this question. Uh, and then you also want to work with people who are really trying to push some exploration, to push some uh, innovative practices. Uh, so, for instance, that's what we did with uh, the CNES uh, when we worked with a new space uh, division, uh, which is trying really to reconfigure and, and think differently about how to develop uh, special programs. So these are really the two logics that we have been uh, experiencing. You just launched a new chair d dedicated to art thinking. What will uh, you be doing within the chair? Yes, so, uh, you know, for the last semester, uh, we had about one to two improbable seminars every week. So it's growing, but we are still in the NFC. So we need to, to, to get funding to organize better what we do and to continue the exploration. And I was extremely pleased to be able to uh, have these uh, discussions with uh, Galerie Lafayette and more particularly Philippe Ouzet and Guillaume Ouzet, who have been working about uh, creation and creative practices forever. They have strong ties with the art world, with uh, uh, creative worlds, because they have this, uh, among other things, they have this foundation, Lafayette Anticipation, very uh, uh, innovative foundations when it comes to country art. And they have been, you know, Uh, working hard on how to think uh, the connections between the fashion world, the design world, the business world. Uh, so for, for this company, this is very natural to uh, discuss creative practices and to work on these practices uh, as a, an everyday challenge. So the, the goal and the, the motivation for this uh, partnership is beyond the money, is really to go uh, uh, into these questions of creation in the 21st century uh, when we face artificial intelligence, when we face these uh, ecological challenges. So we plan to have you know, a joint uh, seminar, we plan to collaborate with the foundation and of course um, uh, we will have uh, uh, unexpected probably also uh, outcomes and projects because I think that both sides are very open to uh, yeah, unexpected uh, and improbable uh, practices. Uh, but I think that's a key moment uh, also to boost uh, maybe the soft power. As you know, uh, business schools are highly connected with American practices and we tend to implement and import practices in terms of knowledge, in terms of pedagogy from the US. That's fine. That's great. But I, I think also sometimes it could be interesting to push our perspectives, our culture, and uh, the art thinking approach and the improbable seminar that we developed here in France uh, could also be a way 
to offer alternatives uh, in other parts of the world, in Asia, in South America, in Europe, and maybe also in North Amer America. Uh, but to push that, we need resources. Uh, you know that Harvard and Stanford, they have massive uh, funding. Uh, so how could, could we also offer some alternatives? So it's already happening. But uh, we want to go beyond that. And this uh, improbable chair can help uh, boost this uh, European soft power. Okay, great. Thank you. On behalf of ESCP, thank you for choosing us for this journey towards knowledge.